Jasvina Vardita Mastu Mavit Vishavadeni Om Shanti 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 last chapter now, chapter 6, and uh, the, the purpose of the, the last chapter, you see, uh, the whole Vedanta methodology uh, is what makes our knowledge really strong and not just some kind of a vague belief or just incomplete uh, kind of understanding is that uh, this whole uh, <coughs> understanding first in order to understand <coughs> the nature of Atma, what is said is this is uh, what Atma is and then uh, in that arrival also a lot of things are negated but also then very deliberately some other contentions are raised. This is part of the methodology. Yeah, it's, the teacher has to do it. So when the teacher takes another standpoint and negates it, what generally happens is people, if they subscribe to that standpoint, they get hurt. Yeah, and this is a part of uh, part of methodology. Because the, the purpose is not to blame somebody, purpose is not to put somebody down, but the purpose is to make your understanding clear. That is the purpose. So that means you have to take it in that light. Otherwise, every time our teacher used to say, people project on the teacher. The minute the, per the person has to show the other side of what it is not, which is part of the methodology, the person tells oneself, ah, this teacher is too intolerant. This person, is, this teacher is too purist. You know, you tell yourself things which are not accurate. This person is too vehement. Hey, that is part of learning. So that means part of methodology is to show what it is not. And part of the understanding on part of the teacher is what? To understand what it is not. Because only when you understand what it is not, you will really understand what it is. You can't have a vague understanding of this whole reality. So that whole methodology was used to give you understanding of Atma. Now, slowly... Always in all Upanishads and especially in Brahma Sutra and in Manukya, everywhere. Uh, what also then happens is towards the end, when you have demonstrated what Vedanta is saying is um, uncontradictable and it is something which is giving a totally coherent vision and what it is talking about ultimately is not away from you but your self-evident Atma. Once the whole thing is clear, what they also do is um, expose you to what different different philosophies which have given a thought about what is Atma and they have come to different conclusions. And now what Vedanta is saying is what compared with what those other schools of thoughts are thinking. Now you should be able to find out what are the, effects. <coughs> the, the purpose of that is not to put those people down. The purpose is to really be able to distinguish. See, knowledge means you have to be a discerning human being. Discerning means you, be, you have to distinguish between differences if there are differences. If you are not able to distinguish, that is called dull wit. So when there are differences and if you are not able to discern the differences, means your mind is not refined enough. So the purpose is to make your mind more and more and more refined 
therefore you can capture the reality accurately. So now that whole exercise is done in six chapter. So what Vedanta is saying is little bit tested against other uh, systematic philosophies. Not just our perception and what we think, but systematic philosophies. So it starts with the first verse. Swabhavam eke kavayaha vadanti kalam tatha anye parimuhyamanaha devasya esha mahimatu loke yena idam brahmyate brahma chakram. So that means here it says that now, uh, see before um, it is what uh, uh, like yesterday Rajan was saying, you open your eyes and you see something and you have a conclusion. That is what a layman's conclusion. And all those layman's conclusions were already taken into account in what and how they are not accurate in, in the teaching. Because these conclusions are based on certain data, but it's not accurate. The conclusions are wrong. So they were corrected by Pramana. Now, the learned men's uh, conclusions are looked into, not layman's. So this is what it says, what the learned men speak about inherent nature of things, and some speak of time as the cause of the universe. They all indeed are deluded. It is the greatness of the self-luminous Lord that causes the will of Brahman to evolve. So that means, now we are going to look at what learned men's conclusions. So this is uh, just to start with a little bit of a light note. When you open your eyes <coughs> and you look at the world, the natural conclusion that you have is what? There are different forms and I am attached to one form and I am different from everyone else. That's a layman's conclusion. What is a layman's conclusion? That I am different from you and you are different from me and me, I am different from the tree and the tree is different from the animal and animal is different from reptile and reptile is different from what? The bird. This is a layman's conclusion. Now, there are philosophers. And philosophers' attempt is to understand the universe. So, when they understand the universe, uh, they make some kind of a distinction. And when you make that distinction, when you conclude that there are many, at any level, then that is what we call Dvaita school of philosophy. We are all not Dvaita schools of philosophy. Our conclusions are based on what? Just our normal perception, it is not Dvaita school of philosophy. Dvaita school of philosophy is they look into the universe and they conclude what that there are is exactly two. Two at so many different levels. Yeah. So this is what it says. Now we are going to begin to see different schools which are looking into the universe, engaging with it deeply and still the conclusion is what? So, um, just to start with a, on a light note, then we'll go to the next verses. A king had two, two philosophers. So, uh, a, a one philosopher uh, was uh, what we call a Dvaitin and the other one was an Advaitin. So that means this uh, person, uh, somehow uh, the Dvaitin philosopher would give a talk to the king and he would talk, you know, you are different, Ishvara is different and give very extensive logic. And the king will go to sleep in his class. Why would the king uh, goes, go to sleep in his class? Because in a way, what's, what's the big new news? You are just adding a lot of analysis. But the conclusion is what? Is exactly the same which when I opened my eyes and what it gave me. So he didn't find it particularly exciting. But in Dwaitin's class, he found it really exciting because what? The, the per, when I open my eyes, I see many and the Dwaitin is telling me there is one and he's getting away with it. Why is he getting away with it? Because uh, he has got very extensive arguments to show you why it is so.
So he was finding it what very challenging. So now this Dvaitin philosopher was getting very jealous of Advaitin. So in my class the king sleeps and in this Advaita class he is all very alert and he is trying to engage and he is trying to figure out and he is trying to... So he always had this sense of rivalry and he was always unhappy, right? Now he says, now I have to find a way to bring this Advaitin down. He keeps saying, what, 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 what nonsense is this, you know? Because he, he had convinced himself that the world cannot be one. So all his arguments were wanting to show that the world is not one. Uh, so uh, now um, the, the, he now is looking for an opportunity to what <coughs> expose Advaiti. Then once the king had gone uh, for uh, hunting in the forest. And uh, what happened is, while the whole retinue was going, um, uh, the Advaitin philosopher, he saw a wild elephant coming. And a wild elephant means what? If, you, if, we, if the wild elephant charges, can destroy. Can all, uh, all of you can destroy. So what this uh, Adva, the Advaitin philosopher, he immediately, what did he do? He alerted what? The king. And he says, you know, this wild elephant is uh, charging. So immediately what did uh, the king do? He retreated and he went back to his camp. Now, what happened? The king was even happier with the Advaitin because he saved his life. So now the Advaitin became even more popular with uh, the king. Now, what happened is, uh, now Dwaitin saw the whole show and he says, ah, I found a catch. <laughs> <laughs> found a catch, I'm going to show him now. So he quickly goes to the king and he says, uh, the king was extra happy and even more praising the Advaita. He says, what are you doing? So he says, why? He saved our life, not only my life, but everybody's life. So we really are very happy today. <coughs> says, what? Did you think about it a little bit more deeply? What? He's talking about oneness, oneness, oneness. But he saw the elephant. Not only he saw the <laughs> elephant, he also, what? Alerted, Alerted you. And he is asking you to run, but not only he's, uh, not only you are running, he also ran. <laughs> if he really knew and if he was really had the vision of oneness, this would not happen. The king thought about it. And the king said, yeah, that's true. He keeps telling me Advaita, 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 and he, he also runs. He also sees the elephant. He also not only sees the elephant, he alerts me. And, and others run and he also runs. What is this Advaita? All nonsense. He gets angry now. He calls the Advaitin philosopher. I'm really upset with you. Advaitin says, why? I saved your life. Then he says, yeah, because you've been fooling me. All this time you've been fooling me. Uh, why? Why have I been fooling you? Uh, because you are talking about oneness. See, this is why you can't talk about loosely oneness. You have to understand the implications of oneness. You've been talking about oneness. You're the one who has seen the elephant. You're the one who are telling me. You're the one who's making us run. You yourself are running. What is this oneness that you are talking about? I am really <coughs> angry with you. And now I want to expel you. And now I understand that this Dvaitin is the one who is right. <laughs> this is our Buddha. Like King's Buddha. <laughs> so now, what, uh, now Advaitin, what do you think he was threatened? Why was he not threatened? Tell me. What is the answer if you were the one? What, what is the answer you would have given to the king?
Yeah, so you said, I never said that these forms don't exist. I never said that this is not true. I said the truth of it is different than what you see. I never said this doesn't happen. Everything exists. Exactly. If you see the meaning of Mitya, you have to understand. We wrongly understand Mitya. We, the, the, the word Mitya conveys us the meaning it doesn't exist. That is a wrong meaning. The meaning of Mitya is, it is apparently true, but it is not the only reality. It is empirically true. So that is something, this Mitya being not real has made us dissociate with the word. The meaning of the word Mitya does not mean that it is not real. So that means, he said, so that this is the answer. The answer is slightly humorous. He <laughs> said, he said, A, I still maintain there is non-duality. The king said, what? I, I, now you are being foolish. You are still telling me that there is non-duality after the whole thing? And he says, yes. He said, what? <laughs> the, he said, the elephant that you see is Mithya. It's empirically true. It doesn't mean it's not there, right? <coughs> the form can that uh, is uh, coming in front of the elephant is also true. Empirically, it's there. You can't say it is not there. The interaction between this form, so what? There is a wild elephant. The form's characteristic is what? That it will charge. And this person, if you want to save your life, what do you need to do? Run. Run. He said, the elephant is Mithya. This individual is Mithya. When did I say that running was Satyam? <laughs> Smart guys. Running is also Mithya. Wonderful. Where is the problem? This is how you have to understand. Mithya, if you begin to tell yourself because it is Mithya, it is unreal, you will lose your discretion to what? Uh, act intelligently in the universe. You will try to skip it. It's skipping is the one which will give you, uh, put you down into Mithya. Deluded. Deluded. Which will keep you in your delusion. Trying to evade something which is empirically true. You can add to the story saying that I didn't want the elephant to make you from form to formless. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that means that when you have when you understand mithya, you have to take your understanding of mithya all the way through and do what needs to be done. If you take it all partially, that means the understanding is not, you know, there the running is made as satyam and ev everything else is falsely said as mithya. And when there are things that need to be what, that you need to see, you don't see. This is not knowledge. That's why making way, the, uh, the person <coughs> who is a Vedantin is extremely what you said about the forms, the laws. Doesn't say, oh yeah, all this is Mithya. Hey, all this is Mithya, no, all your decisions have to be made in Mithya world. All your emotions exist in Mithya world. Everything exists, the teacher exists in Mithya world. The, the Upanishad world exists in Mithya world. In fact, there is only Mithya world. Exactly. I mean, Absolutely. So that means, so that means, you can't skip Mithya. The knowledge of oneness is not as a result of skipping Mithya. The knowledge of oneness comes because you understand the nature of Mithya and what the Satyam which is what the basis of this Mithya. So that means mithya as unreal, this we have to erase. Somewhere down below we get stuck.
because we don't give uh, as though mithya is just like you know not to be paid attention to i'm only interested in satyam a you are interested in satyam you have to figure out satyam in mithya world you can't be indifferent to mithya so that means uh, this is what is you know so this is what it is so now you need to be clear about what this is vision of oneness oneness what is it so now <coughs> let us look at some um a different different uh, schools of uh, thought so when we um, uh, looked at uh, the vision of advaita in the first few classes we uh, compared the uh, vision of advaita with three common um, uh, three common contentions that people have one is a position of an atheist the other is a position of an agnostic and the third one is of a believer Believe. we saw that okay and in all three uh, you can't compare vedanta to any of the three we saw it very clearly and we gave the example of how vedanta is if you begin if you still keep you know people keep uh, after i tell so much people still say yeah so you know what uh, yeah this is you know is uh, they there is no distinction between the so called the religion Uh, and uh, what vedanta people keep mixing it up religion and vedanta are little different the religion has what a, a, a theology a theology which is uh, which is at times can be very faulty and if you can't if, if you compare uh, religion to vedanta then you put it all in the same category vedanta is inquiry based here it is just you know you have some uh, uh, some uh, idea theology which can be highly faulty so you have to be ready for that you can't just equate it all and say oh, they are all lovely they, they could be lovely people but there is a wrong ideology you have to see it we are not when we are uh, when we are making you see the difference in the ideological logical uh, errors in ideology we are not criticizing people this is the basic in any inquiry if you keep on mixing up the ideas with people and keep on getting hurt you will get nowhere nothing is personal here the wrong ideas have to be dropped in order for you to understand the knowledge this has to be very very clear you can't get hurt and you can't see it as criticism of people it's got nothing to do with people that basic that is a the, uh, like step 1 of inquiry so therefore now so that means we saw the corrections now let us look at the existing schools of thought the schools of thought that we have is what vaisheshika and nyayika so these uh, schools of thought have a contention they are actually also looking at the vedas and they have a different conclusion so what is their conclusion their conclusion is actually quite interesting there it, uh, it is almost like a, a science model then then model they say that there are some basic things in the universe what are the basic things in the universe uh, anu parmanu anu is what parmanu is particle anu is atom, atom. then um, Uh, then uh, uh, what? Then there are what gunas. 
there are gunas, there are some which are inherent gunas and some which are incidental uh, gunas. So that means world is a combination of what, it's, it's a put together of all <coughs> different atoms and gunas coming together. So this is what is the Nayaika in Vaisheshika view of the world. Now, uh, tell me, uh, how if you were a Vedantin, how would you argue against that? Where did all this came from? Yeah, exactly. So this Hanu itself, where does it come from? And who is, how, how it is getting a reaction? Exactly. And how is it put together? So that is, you know, so then they say that there are uh, some, um, um, <coughs> some gunas which are inherent and some gunas which are not inherent. So that means, uh, let's say, um, when I say the table is, uh, if it was painted blue, for example, this blueness, is it inherent nature of the table or it's incidentally? It's incidentally. It's not an inherent nature, right? Because one can also paint this table red. So that means the blueness or redness is what an incidental nature of this table. But if it was, um, uh, let's say if I say the salt is salty, is it an inherent nature of salt or is it uh, something which is uh, the what? incidental? Inherent. 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 Because you, you never find salt without being salty. Okay? So now they say that some things inherently what come with what these connection, uh, you know, uh, uh, inherent connections uh, come and some are what incidental connection. So what is knowledge? When everything is mixed up here, you have to, <coughs> what is the nature of knowledge as a result of very big inquiry, what do you have to understand? You have to understand that what, that this Atma that is there is what a result of what assemblage of Arnus and Parmanus. This is little bit like the uh, scientific model. Me is what an assemblage of uh, atoms and particles and I am a product of uh, uh, the, the particles. Some are inherent attributes, some are not inherent attributes. So that means that this is the inquiry. The inquiry leads to, so that's, this is what, see how far the science, we go with what, that I am this individual. Science goes far and says, this individuality, what is the original component of this individuality, atoms and particles? It actually amounts to the same thing. Some are inherent characteristics, some are, some are incidental characteristics. So that means when you are lucid about that, that is called what? knowledge. So this is what we call Vaisheshika and Neyayika philosophy. So what is it, what is the building block of the universe according to them? Gunas and atoms. Excellent. The objects and gunas and the whole universe is assemblage, assemblage of atoms and gunas. Now, uh, uh, and the, uh, just exactly uh, the two things you can ask and they, they have no answer. Where did these so-called building blocks come from and how did they assemble? So that means you have no answer. So this is how logically you say, hey, your answers are not complete. Maybe they are not wrong, but they are not complete. You have not, you ended at some point which is not giving me all the answers. And also in terms of where the laws come from. Exactly. Absolutely. And what would be an intrinsic guna according to them? So the intrinsic is like, you know, uh, this uh, uh, samabhaya sambandha and then there is uh, sayuja and samabhaya sambandha. So intrinsic guna is like salt is salty. And the table may or may not be red or blue. So that's it. Yeah. Now, 
there is what we call Sankhya philosophy. What is the Sankhya philosophy? They also talk about knowledge, that there is a confusion in this world. The way we see it, uh, we uh, uh, see for <coughs> us everything is mixed up. So what is the nature of discrimination that we have to do? They said, when we see, you know, everything is mixed up, there are two things here. There is Prakriti and then, then there is Purusha. What is this Prakriti? Prakriti is what? A Trigunatmika Prakriti. So Prakriti is what? All, every object that you see is Prakriti. Now, what is the nature of mistake that we have made? Purusha, which is distinct from Prakriti, we have taken it, when I say I am as good as the body, I have taken Purusha, which is distinct from Prakriti, as Prakriti. So, what is the nature of knowledge according to Sankhya? You have to separate what Purusha from Prakriti. So, you have to understand the world as Prakriti and Purusha is what? This conscious being which is distinct from Prakriti. It almost seems exactly the same as what Vedanta. What is the difference? The, both of the resolution of both into one is where they are stuck with two. Exactly. This is Dvaita school. Dvaita school because for them, now look at this, Rajan is right. For them, even though you are discriminating between Prakriti and Purusha, Prakriti and Purusha remain what? Two different things. Dvaita, Dvaiti school. And how do they refer to and Ishwara there or Paramatma? The, the, when they bring, no, they don't bring. They don't so bring. they don't bring. So then yoga, so I will come to that. So they, uh, they say Prakriti is different from Purusha. Now that means when I separate myself from the body and mind, I become what one pocket of consciousness. And when you separate yourself from your body and mind, you also become what one pocket of consciousness. So that means not only it is Dvaita because not only the Purusha is different from Prakriti, but one Purusha is different from another Purusha. Another Purusha. Dvaita. Dvaita school. So that means this is how they conclude. So yes, there is a mix up between Prakriti and Purusha. And what is it that you have to separate? And you have to separate Purusha from Prakriti. But still there is what? Lot of Dvaita. Now, in addition to that, uh, uh, then we ask them questions. What is, now if you uh, meet uh, a Dvaita in uh, Sankhya, Sankhya, the person who subscribed to Sankhya philosophy, how would you argue? What would you say? The same question saying, where did this come from? Where did this come from? I go down and... Exactly. Down and so this Prakriti, now look at this, what we argue with them. This, the, so what they say is, the consciousness lies with Purusha and Prakriti is Jada. Jada means it's inert. I said, then we argue, something which is totally inert, can it uh, undergo change and or in an organized fashion and produce so many different forms? So, first of all, that Prakriti, which was unmanifest, how did it become a, a manifest if it was totally jada? And jada is not able to do anything. Jada means inert. It cannot become from what uh, unmanifest to manifest. And having manifested, it cannot what uh, organize itself. It requires what intelligence. So this is why this prakriti that you are talking about, and you are talking about prakriti then manifesting, and then what? It is not possible if it is inert. And purusha is totally different from prakriti, and consciousness lies only <coughs> on purusha. And either it cannot change and organize itself. So then they said, yeah, that also sounds right. 
they are also honest. <laughs> they are not uh, so, oh, yeah, somehow I want to prove my point. Then they come with some uh, yoga philosophy. So, yoga philosophy. See, please, people who are studying yoga, it's nothing to do with, this is an argument that Adi Shankaracharya is having with people who have different contentions about what the nature of reality is. It is not to be taken as criticism of people who are doing yoga. Please, that much discretion you have to use. If you take it as an attack on yoga, it's not an attack on yoga. This is inquiry. This is called inquiry. So therefore, they say what is called Sa Ishwar Sankhya is yoga. Sa Ishwar Sankhya, yoga, what does it mean? This kind of a soup that they get into, which is an inner thing, is kind of make, becoming many. It is illogical. And it is organizing itself is illogical. So then they want to provide an answer to it. So they create one more entity. And what is that one more entity? Ishwara. Then that for them explains. There is Prakriti, there is Purusha and then there is Ishwara. What does Ishwara, what is the role of Ishwara in this whole design? Ishwara what the, uses that inner prakriti and then what manifests as many and places Purusha in a way that Purusha doesn't know I am separate from prakriti. So the consciousness in the mind is then the placing of Ishwara in this body or not? No, Ishwara is separate. See, Ishwara is also separate. For them, there are three entities. But how they, do they explain the consciousness in my mind? Yeah, so that means there is a, a, there is conscious, there is a pocket of consciousness, mm -hmm. there is Prakriti, and what does Ishwara do? Ishwara mm -hmm. combines the both and places it in a way that there is a mix-up. I mean, there is, there is a seeming mix-up. And what do you need to do? You need to separate three things. You need to understand Prakriti as Prakriti, you have to understand Purusha as Purusha and Ishwara as Ishwara. So, what is Ishwara made of? So, that is what we have to ask them. Because they, Ishwara is that intelligence which is putting a Prakriti and Purusha together. Assembly. <coughs> Assembly. So that means, now, it seems also like Vedanta. What is the difference between Vedanta and Yoga? From there comes the Prakriti. From there comes all exactly. the elements. But this is uh, <coughs> different from Ishvara, so it's no answer then. Exactly. It is like saying, Ishvara, using something which is already there, yes, yes. right, <coughs> made the world. So then the next question is, if something is already there, mm -hmm. then how did that come about? Who created it? Using it, exactly. So then you have another Ishvara, then you have infinite regression. Mm -hmm. And if the Purusha is also there, this consciousness is a hanging in the air. Uh, what is the so how, where is it coming from? So that means this philosophy is something, now again, so that means it also is within Dvaita. Why is it within Dvaita philosophy? Actually, it's Dvaita philosophy. <laughs> exactly. Dvaita does not mean only two. Dvaita okay. means... More than one. If, exactly. <laughs> it means more than one. <coughs> Anything which is the conclusion is more than one becomes a Dvaita. Duality. It means not two. Okay. Dvaita doesn't mean two. Dvaita means duality. Duality means in order for duality to be there, you need minimum two or two or more. Two or more. <laughs> <laughs> two or more. This is what is called Dvaita school. So that means now in order to answer that question, they have created what one more entity and then there are also lots of logical errors. <coughs> 
So, these are all different schools of thought. <coughs> now, there is a last school of thought which is extensively argued uh, against, that is Purvani Masaka. So, when you study, uh, if you study Indian philosophy uh, in some university, then they will tell you that uh, this whole Indian philosophy has six schools of thought. Six schools of thought and each one is treated as what? Equal to the other. They are just all different viewpoints. And there is no conclusive this thing. They are just thinking like this differently and each one is what? As valid as the other. This is how the academics present it. This traditional study of Vedanta presented Presence, I think itself has schools of thought which finally argue and contradict and probably <coughs> the, the traditional, uh, when you study traditional Vedanta, Vedanta is not considered as school of thought, it is considered as Pramana. Pramana is a means of knowledge. Means of knowledge means it's revealing something and then what? It cannot be contradicted by anything else. Neither your layman's opinion nor what a philosophical opinion. Cannot be contrary. It cannot so be it's contrary. like saying the Upanishads and the Sutras exist as a means of knowledge. Means of knowledge. The interpretations have come out as schools. Excellent. Excellent. The wrong interpretations come out as schools. <laughs> but the Upanishads are so clear what Advaita vision it's totally clear. How can we misinterpret it? Hey, you go and you ask. There are hundreds of teachers. Course simplified. In this, in this world right now, and they are all quoting Gita. They are all quoting Upanishad. They are saying all kinds of things. Whatever comes to their mind, they say, and they have thousands of followers. No, I th that itself it's is true. Very true. If in fact, if you read it literally, like I said, that the deep meaning. You might actually get the other way and still conclude the other way also, sir. Unless you're taught specifically. Yeah, because taught. Man, Nima has taught us through this, we are now saying it is simple. But, but if you're a different one. teacher with Advaita and you're not going to Advaita, you have to still conclude the other way. There are multiple Upanishads, <laughs> all coming to the same. Yeah, point. all of them. And see, there is so much extensive analysis for uh, them to say this is exactly the fourth Brahma Sutra, it says Tattu Samanvayat. That to Samanvayat means this is exactly what Pankaj is saying. But no matter which Upanishad you look, from what standpoint, it all comes to this one thing that it wants to convey, and that is what <coughs> you are the whole. That you, you do Samanvaya, reconcile, uh, reconciliation of all Upanishads reconciliation of Bhagavad Gita and say, hey, what is it that it wants to convey to us? Is it the vision of duality or is it the vision of non-duality? You can't start that inquiry if you start with a starting point, let everyone be heard. <coughs> so you start an inquiry with that starting point, this is the mistake we make when we come to spirituality. We start with a wrong paradigm, let everyone be true, because that let everyone be true seems like a very nice, accommodating, compassionate position. Then we are not rigorous in inquiry. Hey, what is it saying? And this is not what it is saying. And the Indian philosophy, the people were highly rigorous, highly rigorous. It didn't start with this dilly dally attitude. Unfortunately, now whole of spirituality has become dilly dally. All, all, anything goes. I don't know this, but it sounds yeah. nice. Dilly dally. <laughs> dilly dally means oh, wow, wonderful, floating. <laughs> 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 <coughs> Feeling good, floating, wonderful, you know, it's like that. <laughs> just so then, for my understanding, <laughs> these, these are minor uh, uh, groups and Advaita is major or all are similar outlines. 
Sometimes some people just keep arguing and follow that. What is your question? <coughs> you are into yeah. uh, Dvaita. Uh, okay. In terms that, of percentage. Okay, okay, that's true. See, that's an interesting question. Um, see, so many people uh, go and study uh, the Vedanta, right? I have not seen people actually going and studying Nyayaika philosophy. You know, there, there are no real gurus for like, I want to go and uh, study Nyayaika. I want to go and study Vaisheshika. You don't even find too much what this Sankhya. Sankhya you don't there. find. You don't find that many. You find people following yoga, but what they do is this Patan Ashtanga Yoga. Ashtanga Yoga, mostly they are... Uh, doing, uh, are they thinking about, yeah, is it that Sir Ishwara Sankhya, they are only going uh, to yoga for what, starting with what, their physical well-being, which is wonderful, wonderful, they don't even know that there is a big philosophy which is guiding this asanas, they just go for physical